The moment everything changed. The year was 1971. In the gleaming halls of Rolls-Royce's Darby facility, journalists gathered to witness what should have been a triumph. The RB211, not just another turbofan engine, but a three-shaft revolution that promised to rewrite the laws of aviation propulsion engineers who had defied every conventional wisdom about engine design, stood ready to demonstrate their masterpiece to Lockheed for the L1011 TriStar. As test pilots advanced the throttles on the prototype engines, the distinctive triple-spool architecture responded with a refined power that whispered where others roared, the advanced fan design. Initially conceived with revolutionary materials, spun with an elegance that seemed to mock the crude metal designs of competitors. Here was efficiency given physical form, a promise of quieter skies and longer ranges. This wasn't just another engine, it was British engineering audacity crystallized into titanium and advanced alloys. A bet the company gambled that would either crown Rolls-Royce as the undisputed king of aerospace or destroy a company that traced its heritage back to 1906 in spectacular fashion. The old guard under siege. For decades, the aviation world had been a gentleman's club. Pratt & Whitney's JT-9D engines powered the first Boeing 747s. Massive, proven, profoundly American General Electric had muscled in with their CF-6 series, applying their industrial might to aviation with characteristic determination. Rolls-Royce engines, meanwhile, powered the British fleet like noble warhorses. The Avon and the Comet and Caravelle, the Conway and the VC-10 and Boeing 707, the Spey and the Trident, and BAC-111. Elegant and refined, but increasingly looking like yesterday's technology. Then came the wide-body revolution of the late 1960s, and suddenly every airline wanted American engines that could deliver bypass ratios above 5 to 1. The jumbo jet era wasn't coming. It had arrived with the subtlety of a sonic boom. Traditional British engines with their lower bypass ratios and smaller fan diameters looked like Spitfires at a Saturn V launch. Sir Frederick Henry Royce himself had once declared that the quality of a product would remain long after its price was forgotten. But his company's descendants now faced a brutal question. What happens when your competitors redefine what quality means? David Huddy, managing director of Rolls-Royce, watched Boeing's jumbo jet take to the skies and knew that incrementalism would mean death. The company needed something revolutionary, something that would leapfrog the Americans entirely. The answer would come from their Bristol division, where Adrian Lombard was developing concepts that seemed to violate the accepted rules of turbofan design. Dancing with disaster. The engineers, many of them veterans who had worked on the Olympus that powered Concorde, had already tested their three-shaft philosophy with the RB203 Trent in 1967 mounted on a converted Avon testbed. It was supposed to be a straightforward demonstrator proving that three concentric shafts could deliver unprecedented efficiency by allowing each compressor stage to rotate at its optimal speed. Flying behind the experimental engine was like riding a thoroughbred with three hearts, smooth at cruise but prone to violent compressor surges during rapid throttle movements. Test pilots from the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment at Boscombe Down described the experience as wrestling with an engine that had three different personalities. The intermediate pressure spool would hunt for its optimal speed creating a resonance that could shake the entire airframe. Critics within the company, particularly those from the traditional Darby works, called it complexity for complexity's sake. Pratt & Whitney was succeeding with two shafts on the JT-9D. Why did Rolls-Royce need three? The revolutionary Heifel carbon fiber fan blade program, led by engineer Gordon Lewis, was consuming resources at an alarming rate. Each bird strike test that shattered the composite blades cost the equivalent of a suburban house Lockheed was growing increasingly nervous about their L1011 TriStar program, having bet their own future on Rolls-Royce delivering the promised engine. The pattern break. But then came a moment of clarity during testing at the National Gas Turbine Establishment at Pystock. Engineers discovered that by redesigning the variable stator vanes and allowing each spool to accelerate and decelerate independently, the engine transformed. The three shafts stopped fighting each other and began working in concert, each finding its natural harmonic like a perfectly tuned orchestra. The board faced their Rubicon moment, retreat to conventional two-shaft designs and accept permanent second-tier status, or commit fully to the three-shaft design despite the technical challenges Chairman Sir Denning Pearson, under immense pressure from both the government and shareholders, made the fateful decision to proceed. The development costs had already exceeded 170 million pounds, double the original budget but turning back now would mean certain irrelevance in the new age of wide-body aviation. Engineers worked in shifts around the clock at the Darby and Bristol facilities. The Heifel composite fan blades, despite their theoretical advantages in weight savings, 
continued to fail catastrophically in testing each failure meant redesigning not just the blade, but the entire fan module to accommodate different stress patterns. Meanwhile, General Electric was already delivering CF6 engines to Douglas for the DC-10, and Pratt & Whitney's JT-9D was accumulating flight hours on the 747. The Titanium Pivot The decision to abandon Heifel came from Stanley Hooker, who had returned from retirement to help save the program. At a crisis meeting in late 1970, Hooker delivered his verdict on the composite blades with characteristic bluntness, we're trying to run before we can walk, the material science isn't ready. This wasn't about lying, as legend would later suggest, but about recognizing that revolutionary engines didn't require revolutionary materials in every component. The switch to titanium fan blades added weight, but brought reliability. More crucially, it allowed engineers to focus on perfecting the three-shaft architecture itself. The RB211's unique configuration meant that the large diameter fan could rotate at roughly 3,000 RPM for optimal efficiency, while the high-pressure compressor spun at over 10,000 RPM for maximum compression. The intermediate shaft, rotating at around 6,000 RPM, acted as a perfect bridge between these two extremes. Technical revolution. This configuration delivered something unprecedented, an engine with a bypass ratio of 4.3 to 1 that was both more powerful and more fuel efficient than competing designs. The initial RB211-2, 2B produced 42,000 pounds of thrust, less than the JT9D's 46,950 pounds, but with significantly better specific fuel consumption, the engine's modular design meant that airlines could swap entire sections during maintenance, reducing downtime from days to hours. The acoustic signature was revolutionary. The three-shaft design naturally created destructive interference patterns that canceled out certain frequencies, where the JT9D produced a distinctive roar that could be heard miles from airports, the RB211 generated what acoustic engineers called brown noise, a lower frequency rumble that dissipated more quickly in atmosphere communities near Heathrow Airport specifically requested that airlines schedule RB211 powered aircraft for night flights. Test data from Lockheed revealed another advantage. The RB211's throttle response was 40% faster than competing engines. This meant shorter takeoff rolls and better go-around performance, critical safety advantages that translated directly into operational flexibility. Captain George Cooper of Eastern Airlines, one of the first to fly the L-1011, reported, It's like switching from a steam engine to a turbine. The power is instantaneous and smooth as silk. The Government Intervention On February 4, 1971, Rolls-Royce Limited declared bankruptcy. The first time a major British industrial company had collapsed since the war, the development costs had reached 195 million pounds, far exceeding the company's entire market capitalization. Prime Minister Edward Heath faced a dilemma. Let Rolls-Royce fail and potentially destroy British aerospace, or intervene to save technology that was clearly revolutionary but financially catastrophic. The government chose intervention, but with surgical precision. The automotive division was separated and sold back to private ownership, while the aerospace division was nationalized as Rolls-Royce, 1971 Limited. This wasn't a bailout, but a recognition that the RB211 represented a technological leap that Britain couldn't afford to lose. The government injected 250 million pounds to complete development and certification. When the RB211-22B finally entered service with Eastern Airlines on April 26, 1972, it vindicated every technical decision. The L1011 TriStar, powered by three RB211S, could fly from Miami to Los Angeles with full payload and arrive with more fuel reserves than DC-10S, flying the same route. The engine achieved a dispatch reliability of 99.89% within its first year, unprecedented for such a complex new design. Cultural impact. The aviation industry watched in amazement as the company that had nearly died produced an engine that redefined excellence. Airlines that had written off Rolls-Royce as finished suddenly found themselves placing orders. British Airways, which had initially been skeptical, made the RB211 Dash, powered L1011, the flagship of their long haul fleet. The engine that nearly destroyed Rolls Royce became the foundation of its resurrection. For British engineering, it was both vindication and warning. The RB211 proved that revolutionary innovation could still emerge from Britain, but the bankruptcy demonstrated the enormous risks of pushing too far beyond existing technology. The three shaft design influenced engine development globally. Soviet engineers at Aviad Vigatel attempted to copy the configuration for their PS-90, while Japanese engineers at IHI studied it intensively for their future collaborations. The Empire Expands 
Boeing's decision to offer the RB211-535 on their 757 in 1979 marked a turning point. Boeing engineers had initially been skeptical of the three-shaft design's complexity, but flight test data was undeniable. The 757 powered by RB211S could operate from shorter runways than those with Pratt and Whitney engines, opening up airports like London City that would otherwise be inaccessible to jets of that size. American Airlines, traditionally loyal to American engines, shocked the industry by selecting RB211-powered 757s for their transcontinental routes. The engine's efficiency meant they could fly coast to coast without refueling, even from hot and high airports like Denver. Delta Airlines followed suit, eventually operating the largest fleet of RB211-powered aircraft outside Britain. Airlines discovered unexpected advantages. The RB211's modular construction meant that spare parts inventory could be reduced by 30% compared to competing engines. The three-shaft design's inherent stability meant longer intervals between overhauls. Singapore Airlines reported that their RB211-524S on Boeing 747-400S required 25% less maintenance man-hours than their previous engines. In the Persian Gulf, where temperatures regularly exceeded 45 degrees Celsius, the RB211's flat-rated design meant it could deliver full power when other engines had to be derated. Emirates and Gulf Air could maintain their schedules year-round a crucial advantage in the hub-and-spoke model they were pioneering, military applications, and special variants. While the civilian RB211 captured headlines, military derivatives quietly revolutionized naval propulsion. The Royal Navy selected the RB211 based MT-30 for their Type 45 destroyers, making them the most powerful gas turbine-powered warships ever built. The same three-shaft architecture that delivered efficiency in the air provided unprecedented power density at sea. The industrial RB211 found applications in power generation and pipeline compression. Power plants in Southeast Asia used RB211 derived turbines to provide emergency power during the 1990s economic boom. The engine that had been designed to fly at 40,000 feet proved equally capable at sea level, generating electricity for millions. Special variants pushed boundaries further. The RB211-524G-T, developed for the Boeing 747-400 in 1989, produced 58,000 pounds of thrust while maintaining the same fuel efficiency as the original Dash 22B. The Dash 535E 4-B variant for the 757 became the quietest engine in its class, meeting noise regulations that wouldn't become mandatory for another decade. Technology transfer and global impact. The RB211's influence extended far beyond Rolls-Royce. The three-shaft configuration became the template for the Trent family, which would power everything from the Airbus A330 to the A380 and Boeing 787. Each generation built upon lessons learned from the RB211, gradually incorporating the advanced materials that had been premature in 1970. General Electric, initially dismissive of three-shaft complexity, eventually developed their own triple-spool design for certain applications, Pratt and Whitney's geared turbofan, revolutionary in its own right, acknowledged intellectual debt to Rolls-Royce's work on optimal shaft speeds. The engine that had nearly failed became the ancestor of virtually every modern high-bypass turbofan. The slow sunset. The arrival of ultra-high-bypass engines in the 1990s didn't immediately obsolete the RB211, but it marked the beginning of a gradual transition. Newer engines offered bypass ratios exceeding 9 to 1, while the RB211 maxed out around 4.5 to 1. Airlines began calculating fuel costs to the fraction of a cent, and even small efficiency improvements justified fleet replacement. Environmental regulations tightened progressively through the 2000s. The RB211 met every standard when introduced, but margins eroded. Chapter 4, Noise Regulations Introduced in 2006 Required Modifications That Added Weight and Complexity carbon emission trading schemes made every percentage of fuel burn financially significant. Rolls-Royce ceased producing new RB211s in the mid-1990s, though support continued for decades. The last passenger service RB211 flight occurred when Delta retired their 757s in 2020. Nearly 50 years after the engine's first run, cargo operators continue flying RB211-powered aircraft, testament to the design's fundamental durability, the Trent dynasty and modern legacy. The Trent 700, launched in 1989, carried forward every lesson from the RB211. Where the RB211 had pioneered three shafts, the Trent perfected them. Where the RB211 had failed with composites, the Trent succeeded with fan blades made from titanium alloy and later carbon fiber. 
The Trent XWB, powering the Airbus A350, produces 97,000 pounds of thrust, more than double the original RB211, while consuming less fuel per pound of thrust. Today's Rolls-Royce, returned to private ownership in 1987, stands as one of the big three engine manufacturers alongside General Electric and Pratt & Whitney. The company that nearly vanished in 1971 now holds a 40% market share in wide-body engines. Every Trent engine carries DNA from the RB211. The three-shaft architecture, the modular design philosophy, the obsession with efficiency over raw power, the human cost, and triumph. Behind the technical specifications lie human stories of extraordinary dedication. Engineers like Adrian Lombard and Stanley Hooker staked their reputations on unproven technology. Families endured years of uncertainty as the program teetered between triumph and disaster. The Darby and Bristol communities watched their primary employer nearly vanish, then rise from bankruptcy stronger than before. The RB211 story embodies the essential tension in aerospace innovation, the need to push beyond current capabilities while managing enormous financial and technical risks. It demonstrates that revolutionary progress sometimes requires near-catastrophic failure as a catalyst. The engine that should have been Rolls-Royce's tombstone became its resurrection. When modern passengers fly on a Trent-powered aircraft, experiencing that characteristic smooth acceleration and quiet cruise, they're benefiting from decisions made by engineers who refused to accept that good enough was sufficient. The pursuit of perfection, as Sir Henry Royce understood, creates value that endures long after the crises that birthed it fade from memory. Consider the counterfactual. What if Rolls-Royce had played it safe in 1968, developing a conventional two-shaft engine like everyone else? British aerospace might have survived, but it wouldn't have thrived. The Trent family would never have existed. Airbus might have had one less engine option for their aircraft. The industry would have lost a crucial source of competitive innovation. The RB211 story asks us, when facing technological disruption, do you iterate on existing solutions or risk everything on a leap forward? In our current age of sustainable aviation fuel, hydrogen propulsion, and electric aircraft, the RB211's example remains relevant. Revolutionary progress requires revolutionary risk. The question isn't whether we can afford to take such risks, but whether we can afford not to. The RB211 proved that engineering excellence could emerge from crisis, that bankruptcy could proceed breakthrough, and that sometimes the most complex solution is ultimately the simplest it remains. 50 years after its traumatic birth, the engine that saved Rolls-Royce by nearly destroying it. A paradox worthy of the company that has always insisted on building the best, regardless of cost. 